I'm really happy to be here. Dimensions of peace and conflict. That's a big one, Michael. I'll do my best. Over the last few decades, we've seen an increase in global crisis since the end of the Cold War, from Bosnia to different parts of the world, we've seen wars. In Europe and other parts, we've seen a decrease in the number of civil wars, except for the Arab Spring uprisings. But in Africa, we continue to see increased fighting, increased violence, and it's really difficult because people, sometimes you ask yourself if Europe and other parts that have gone through war are embracing democracy and nonviolent strategy, why is it so difficult and why is Africa still embroiled in civil conflict and civil wars? The death tolls and destruction on these countries <coughs> continues to shock humanity. As an African, traveling from one place to the other, when you sit and listen to the stories of some of the of people who have gone through some of the civil wars and some of the different problems in parts of Africa, you, you think, okay, I've heard this one and I'm not going to be shocked again if I hear another one. But then you go to another place and you're shocked again when you hear some of the stories. Stories that make you wonder whether we're still in the primitive world, or is this the 21st century or the modern world? In Diara Congo, rape remains a menace to the lives of women and girls. You hear stories of one woman being raped 20 times, 15 times, and the question you ask yourself, how possible is this? Because the natural mind cannot really comprehend the depth with which people go through problems. Recently in South Africa, a young woman was raped and opened up. And you ask, I, I got shocked when I read this story. And then something said, don't get shocked because anything is possible when it comes to violence in some regions of the world. In northern Uganda, cutting off the lips of women and girls is commonplace for drug emboldened militias. The first time I met some of those women, we were at a conference at the UN. And they kept talking about conflicts and conflicts and conflicts. And one of the things that is so interesting to me is how the world will decide this is the conflict we will focus on and pretend that there is nothing happening in other parts of the world. And as these, as the, these people at the UN kept talking about particular conflict in Iraq, and those were the days when the hype about Iraq was up. And these women sat, but they had their shawls and they were covered up. And they kept talking about the violence that was happening and how many millions of dollars they were putting there to make sure the war ended. And one of the women raised her hand. Because the key for that conversation at that time was the need to help the women in Iraq. And as she raised her hands and stood up, she let the veil drop and her lips had been cut off. And she turned to the ambassadors on the panel. What about Uganda? Am I not a woman? And am I not a victim too? The panel ended because no one had an answer to her question. Those of us who call ourselves activists in the room just sat there and couldn't speak because we were also guilty of inaction when it comes to the issue of Northern Uganda. In some regions where the wars have ended, you still see violence. And the face of violence is predominantly the face of a girl or a woman. These crises have forced the world in universities like Vanderbilt and other places to question and try to seek answers for many things that have gone wrong. In the global community quest for seeking answers, the issue of accountability and responsibility 
have become a major thematic issue. We hear about corporate social responsibility, how multinational companies need to be responsible for their action and provide some sort of relief for the poor and impoverished. We heard about the concept, do no harm, responsibility to protect, accountable and responsible leadership. All of these efforts put together by scholars and practitioners are there to ensure that our world becomes a better place. In communities, many are calling for a revival of a sense of community. Individualism has taken over our world. Bystanding attitude is the order of the day. The weak are being consumed by the mighty and powerful. People who speak differently or act differently are subjected to rules and laws and unspoken rules and unspoken laws that make life very difficult to navigate. Our children, the little ones, have learned this attitude to the point of perfection. Bullying have overtaken daycare and even preschool. Last night, I spoke at Messiah. And of course, when you go to these places, people are so careful about you know, we don't want to go over the time we ask you to come. So President Phipps was really gracious in trying to escort me after I spoke. And I'm just not one of those people who would just leave the hall without engaging. I have to feel and touch and interact. And I said, President Phipps, I'm going to go off protocol. And she said, what are we going to do? I said, I need to touch and interact with your students. And she said, OK. So one after the other, students came and we engaged. And then this woman comes up to me with two little boys. One is about seven. And he said, ma'am, I usually don't sit still when my mom takes me somewhere. But you're really funny, and I like your talk. <laughs> so that's nice. That's a real compliment. I think I won an award just from his, his compliment. And he said, but I have a question for you. I said, what is it? By the time he said, how do you deal with bullies? I said, Jesus, answer for me. Because this is serious matter. And after he asked his question, the one thing that came to mind is something that we're constantly reminded by the elders in our society. It's not what you called, but what you answered to. And I told him, you're a perfect child. You're intelligent. If someone is so weak to the point that they cannot function except by calling you names and trying to make your life miserable. And then he say, how do you deal with someone calling, telling you you're ADD to the point that you want to kill yourself? Seven. Say, no one should ever drive you to that place where you want to kill yourself. But even in preschool, Children have perfected the act of the mighty eating up the weak ones. The question that constantly comes to mind, how did we get to this place? How did we come to a world where though we have perfected the languages of responsibility, care for the others, and all of the good words for putting them into action, have eluded us. I grew up on the old road in Monrovia, my siblings and I. And our neighborhood's kind of peri-urban in the city, but we spoke our native language. There were 10 of Liberia's 16 ethnic groups living there, different people. And if someone was cooking here, you could smell their food. Your back porch was someone's front porch, and your front porch was someone's back porch. But we were children of the community. Even though we live with our individual parents, men and women in the community were responsible for our well-being. They were charged to love, entertain, feed, scold, and discipline. There was never a thing as I grew up that my parents are away and we're going to bring the roof down. Because as soon as 
one neighbor saw the first friend, and then the second friend, and the third friend entering. You get them walk and come to you, come to the front door and say, is there a problem here? Is someone sick? Um, no, sir, no one is sick, and, but our friends decided to come and visit. Um, let me see. And it's not, can I come in? Let me see. <laughs> so you boy, what are you doing here? Get out. <laughs> Get out. And it's not even their house. And we are not even their children. But you dare not say a word. You stood there and took that embarrassment. Because whilst you were thinking that you could bring the roof down, your neighbor's job was to ensure that the roof remained intact. That was the community we grew up in. In 1989, that beautiful country, Liberia, descended into one of the bloodiest civil wars humanity has ever known. 250,000 deaths. Millions of dollars worth of infrastructure destruction. There is not a single household in that nation that can say, my family was not touched by the war. We did not lose a relative. Everyone felt a sense of loss. At 17, I was confused, angry, because I was being introduced to a different side of the community that I did not know exist or existed. This tribe is not your friend. These people are the ones who oppress us. These ones are the rapists, and these are the killers. The question, but weren't these the same individuals who bathed and fed us when parents were away? Weren't these the same people who ensured that the roof was kept intact? Weren't these the same individuals who sacrificed their time to tutor us? It was confusing, it was upsetting, but that was the order of the day. As the war progressed, and as I grew older, our communities got destroyed beyond recognition. But somewhere, in the midst of all of the destruction, we begin to see the reemergence of community. Women were rising and changing the image of their community one person at a time. Stories of women saving a whole group of people came out of the depths of massacres that happened in different communities. One of the stories we heard was of the Lutheran Church massacre. That was one of the biggest massacres where armed men went into the church to kill people. And one of the women who was in one of the classrooms used to be my nursery school teacher. And we called her Auntie Martha. She said, in that room, the soldiers they had sent to kill them came and said, pay for your life. So whilst the shooting was going on in every part of that building, he was taking money from those women and said, I will shoot in the air and make it to look like I'm killing everyone in this room. And you will have to find your way out of here. That's how an entire classroom of almost 25 people survived, because each of those women had to pay something to that soldier in order for him not to kill them. Women were the tiny ray of hope at the end of the tunnel. What we needed as a nation was a larger percentage of mothers and daughters stepping up to the plate and changing the dynamics of their community. So in 2003, we banded together and started something called the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace. The campaign was to protest the war and to seek a peaceful, nonviolent end 
to the conflict. Almost all of us had no idea of what peace building was about. However, we knew that a violent option was not on the list of our strategies for ending the war in Liberia. Every morning we gather together to pray. And as we gather to pray, because we were not in the middle or part of the social class, Sugars, Mrs. Dick's sister, was the only one from that social class who was part of us, would get calls by accident that, oh, this group is meeting with this contact group on Liberia. And then she would tell me, Lema, mobilize the women. We're going to this place. One of the mornings, the UN had sent the crisis group on Liberia. Um, the EU had sent a delegation. The Swedish government had come. The Ghanaian government had come. And there was this huge delegation. And someone called her and said, people are meeting. Are you coming to this meeting? She said, let's go. It was raining cats and dogs. And we got to that place, but we had our statement. We had laminated it because of the rain, and we always had it handy. So these two young women were standing, they had put it in their blouses, and we're standing there with our placards singing, we want peace, no more war. But the armed men, the place was just like all AK-47, and we couldn't even go close to where they were. We just stood there singing, singing, singing. And we had these two very feisty young women with us. And one said to me, boss, I'm crossing the street. I said, no, child, they will not kill you. And sugars went, get back here. Don't even try it. But in like split seconds, they opened the gate to allow the convoy to come out. And that girl just shot past us. And of course, some white men will be curious. And the curious one was the Swedish ambassador. He jumped out of his car and started calling all of the other ambassadors who were trying to get in their car. There's a group of women standing out there. Before he could even finish saying there's a group of women, that young girl was in his face, and we brought this to you. He took the statement, they walked towards us, and we explained to them that we were protesting for peace. We went from place, from this place to that place. We were certain that regardless of whatever it took, we were going to bring peace to our country. As we engaged in the process of building peace, it also became evident to us that we could not do this efficiently if there wasn't a sense of community amongst us. Because you see, the personal is also political. There's no way you can engage in the process of building peace, engage with a group of people, and not care about their well-being. If we said we were peace builders, we had to be the protectors of each other. We had to defend each other, even to death. And so my mentor, Sugars, goes to London. And while she's in London, she makes a statement on BBC. And all of a sudden, everyone panicked because the women were certain that if we were to bring peace, we had to stay out of the political discourse. But do we blame Sugars? She's been a politician, a political activist all her life. So as she, she went and made this statement about some ethnic groups and that it was impossible, they were the cause of the war. She did not mince her word, had her own opinion about President Taylor. The next day, the women came to me, Lema, you have to go on the radio and ostracize sugars from this group. And I told them, you will kill me first before that ever happens. Because you see, when we say we're in it together, we're in it together. If one person falls, it means all of us have fallen. They had meetings we met from 4 in the afternoon till 11 p.m. I would not budge. Two persons joined me. The next day we met till 10 p.m. I had four people on my side. As we met every day, we convinced one woman to join us. And the day she was coming to Monrovia, the day that we were supposed to kick her out of the group was the day we had a show of solidarity. One thing we were clear of afterwards 
if someone made a mistake, we would defend you publicly, even if it meant dying, and privately, we will scold you, but we will never turn our sisters to the sharks. No one afterwards could convince any of us to do anything other than working for peace. After the signing of the peace agreement, we realized that we had to spread the message of oneness and community, and we had to cultivate, you know, we had to spread that message that we've cultivated as we struggle for peace. Very few of us had any idea of the phrase from local to global, but we were convinced that we needed to spread what we had done in our tiny groups to bigger parts of community. We launched the back to school campaign for young fighters. We launched the peace, yes, war, never again campaign. We commissioned ourselves. And you see, when you're fixing something and you're called to do something or you're convicted about the dimensions of peace in your community, you don't wait to be commissioned. So we commissioned ourselves. And one of the things we constantly say to people, we are constructively interfering in the politics of this nation. There was nothing of you, you do not interfere. Because we had come to the place where we realized that if we do not interfere, it was going to affect us. We went into communities to encourage community members to bring the combatants back. And we encouraged women in their communities to go and bring the combatants out. One of my favorite stories is the story of the women of Tolota who went inside a forest area, brought out the combatants into the village, and there was a big tree. Every evening, the combatants would go and sit under that tree. The women dubbed the tree the tree of frustration because that's where these combatants sat and talked about their broken dreams. We were, the war was supposed to offer us wealth, but it offered us deeper Poverty. The war was supposed to offer us recognition, but we are being pushed back into obscurity because of the things that we've done. The war was supposed to offer us homes, but some of us are homeless. So they sat under that tree every day lamenting. And the women got really tired of these boys lamenting because the way they looked, some had dread, like some had very fearful haircuts and different colors of hair. And one of the women told, told us, she walked to them and told them, if you all have to engage this community, you have to come back to the community. And you have to allow us, your mothers, to bring you back. And one of the days, one of them called me. And I said, well, Annie, what's going on? She said, boss, today we're cutting hair like something. <laughs> I said, cutting hair? She said, yes, we're cutting the hair of the fighters. Those boys sat, and women that they had raped and abuse, shave off the hair as a sign that we're bringing you back into the community. I can go on recounting stories of things that my sisters and I did. What is important to note was that as we did this, these actions, we were confronted by the killers of our children. We were confronted by the men who raped and abused us, we were confronted by many things, but did this stop us from working for change? The answer is no. We went to a community when this armament started, fighting erupted again, and we sent the women to go and work with the UN and the combatants. And these women got into the community, into the, the camp, the disarmament camp, and they were assigned to different groups of fighters. And one of the older ladies who's deceased now decided she was going to the room where the wounded combatants were and she would feed them. And she says she sat on that bed and was feeding this young man using her hands and then he called her name. And she said, how do you know me? And he said, I know you very well. Can you help me to sit up? And she helped him up. And then he asked her, where's your daughter? 
Of course, he knew the answer. She said, she got killed. He said, yes, I know. She said, how did you know? I killed her. The question to her as she told this story to us in tears a few hours later, so did you stop feeding him? She said, no. I fed him. Isn't that what peace is all about? You keep your pains in and do what you've been called to do. They never stop. It never stopped us. We continue this and continue to do this work knowing that we're a part of a larger community, a community that will help us heal. And that day, when this woman came and told that story, we had to do a circle. Because one by one, women broke down in tears. And one by one, it dawned on me that all of those women that did this fantastic work of building peace had things that had happened to them that should have been a stumbling block to them engaging nonviolent activism. But one by one, they refused to allow the pain of their experiences to stop them from rebuilding their community. We decided this is the spirit. This is the spirit our country needs. We will spread the spirit of community. We will spread the spirit of oneness. And if spreading the spirit means challenging the powers on the way they conducted their business, we will challenge them. If spreading the spirit meant putting forth our own alternatives and designing alternative actions from what we were getting from various parties in the country, we were prepared to do that. At one point in time, the UN goofed so badly with some of the things they were doing. We issued a statement. The next day, we got the generals, and we're standing at the UN and they walk and say, the generals come in. And the generals look back and say, if the women don't come, we're not coming. Because you see, we had already signed a pact with their folk soldiers who were standing across the street. And the soldiers were saying, if you enter that building and negotiate without these women, when you come out, you're dead meat. So what the, the powers in there did not know was that we were protecting the quote unquote generals from their folk soldiers. So when we went in the room, as they negotiated on how they were going to do certain things, we sent them notes. And people were just confused around the table. How can these generals be taking notes from these women? But we're saying, remember, this is the position of the boys. This is what they say. Finally, the head of the UN then decided, told his staff, gave this thing to the women of Liberia, they know it all. But if spreading the spirit was stepping on a few toes, men stepping on a few toes, we were prepared to do that. Spreading the spirit, in some instances, men eating, talking, feeding the killers of our babies, rapists of women we knew or were connected to. Spreading the spirit, men getting angry, but never letting go of the bigger vision of nonviolent engagement. Spreading the spirit, Men putting nation and the survival beyond self. Did it pay off? Yes. With a few decoration and distinguished recognition for a tiny nation, a nation that was once new as the capital of child soldiers is today known for its women in white. The story of the women of Liberia is the story of women everywhere. It is the story of communities in Europe, America, and Asia. Unfortunately, stories of oneness, responsible communities, and peace are heading away from the eyes of the world. And the stories that have taken over and we are confronted with daily are stories of vices. The media celebrate these vices by airing them twice, four, five times a day. You open a magazine, 
our world has been so overly sexualized, and I don't know if that is a word, but since I'm in a university, I'm testing my skills. <laughs> a few months back, my sister and I were just hanging out in New York, and we're flipping through the pages of a magazine. And as we flip through the pages, I got to one page in the magazine. I said, Father, come and see something. They were advertising a watch. And here lied this young man, only in his underwear, and the watch was on his ties. So I said, you live in New York. Is there another way of wearing watches in this country now? <laughs> Because I could not see the correlation of a wash on a man in his underwears lying on his thighs, unless I missed a beat somewhere in my busy world. But our world is so overly sexualized. The killings of men and women make the headlines. The local news network in this community is not picking up the good stories of young men and women who are making changes. And I was saying to Michael and Cole, my contact with Nashville is that I watched the crime and investigate, or my contact with Tennessee is that I watched the crime and investigation channel. And one of my favorite things is the first 48. Sick, right? <laughs> but Memphis, so you hear Memphis, Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee. 2 a.m. in the morning. Those are the things that make the media. Great things are happening, but our world has been overtaken by the vices. A few years ago, we were in Ivory Coast celebrating the greatness of West African women. And we tried to get all of the big media outlets to come and see what great work, fantastic work in women in different parts of West Africa were doing. No one could come. That same day we opened that conference, they aired the witches of West Africa. Who were the witches? Women. We were so upset. So yes, they have witches, but they also have super girls doing great work. Can you just look here for a moment and stop being negative? But these are the things that move in our world. Responsibility in our global world must begin from home, spread over in our communities and extended to the larger community. It must be highlighted in daily news stories, on blogs, we have a mandate to recreate our world. We must recreate our world for good. And when you look at young people like Michael and his colleagues, young people like the Ingram scholars and young people sitting in this room, you say we have hope. But the hope for this world lies with us, the adults. We need to highlight and make them to feel important. It's time for us to step out and continue to reinforce the greatness, the intelligence of our daughters. Today I ask myself, what is important? Because the media have made our girls to believe that your body starts from here and ends here. There is nothing about brains. It's time that we step out and reinforce what these young people have, what they can offer the world. We can never talk global peace. We can never talk global justice if we leave our young people hanging. It is important for us to step up, in, step out in spaces and in time and places if it means shaking the status quo. But at the end of the day, as long as it's for the greater good of your community, don't be embarrassed to do so. Many years, Later, from the old road, the life we live as children, the spirit of oneness lives on. And somehow, all of those kids that we grew up together, I think we remain commit, connected, invisibly. 
My sister died in 2003, in 2006, and we went back home for the funeral. And the boys in the community, a lot of them have not really done well. They didn't go to school, so they're either house boys or drivers or something. Life is really tough. And we're sitting in the house this evening. They come, they sing a prayerful song, and those young men take a thousand five hundred Liberian dollars and present it to the family and say, "This is our contribution." My only response was, "Wow." In 1996, during the April 6 war, as we call it in Liberia, people were running helter-skelter. The faster you left your home, the greater your chance of survival. We stepped outside and we could only leave the house. I had two kids at the time, my daughter Amber, my son Joshua, and I was heavily pregnant with Arthur. And as we ran out of the house, I had Amber on my back with a basket with all of the kids' medication. Their father was holding Josh. We ran out. And the only thing I kept thinking, Lord, I'm not going to survive. Carrying this baby on my back, heavily pregnant, the walk to my parents' house was close to seven hours. As we got on the road, we saw four young men standing Bullets flying, they're dodging it, people running, and they're just standing there. And then when they saw me, they said, Lebanon, we were looking for you. And they took the baby from my back. One took the basket, the other held my hand. And we started walking. And then my kid's father turned to one of them and said, why did you stay back? His response, we knew she would need help and could not leave without her. There is a way that when that spirit of oneness is cultivated, even when things get tough, it finds its way back into bringing people together. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matters, quote and unquote. What is it that matters to you as a student of Vanderbilt, as a member of this Nashville community, as a scholar, as a future activist? What is important to you? Everything or anything that is important to you you need not to hold back. Step out, stand up, and speak out. Your community awaits you. A key dimension of peace and conflict is the sense of community. Thank you. Thank you. Please have your seats. Um, I'm told that I'm supposed to entertain a few questions, so maybe you can ask something about my love life since that didn't come out in the talk. I'm embarrassing my kids. So we have mics in the back. Do we have people in queue? Yes? Hi again. Um, you kind of discussed this when you met with the Ingram Scholars this afternoon, but I was hoping you could share with everyone here in attendance um, how you as an individual forgive and how the process was with the women around you in the pro that whole process of forgiveness after the Civil War. 
You see, unforgiveness is toxic. It's really toxic. It takes away a lot from you. When you have been offended, you're joined to someone invisibly. I was asking the scholars this afternoon, when you have a beef with someone, as you all say it here, when that person passed by you, what's your first reaction? Your heart skips a beat, right? Right? Young people, old people. It's because you've been joined to that person. When things are okay, you, you do not go through that kind of emotion, except you're really having a crush on someone. But you don't go through that kind of emotion when things are okay. But you're invisibly tied to someone when you've gone through some conflict or they've offended you. And as long as you're tied to this person, it's difficult to progress. Every time you see this person, you're thinking, what is he planning? And every time the person sees you, they're thinking, what is she planning? And I was saying to the students today that even if you achieve your life goal, there will always be something that hinders you from leaving the kind of legacy that you should leave because that bitterness that has consumed you will cause you to always want to pay back. And so instead of being that leader with that spirit or generosity of spirit, you be that leader who will pay back everything and it kind of messed up your legacy. So what is important, whether you're a victim or perpetrator, is to find a way to break that chain. And whether you are the victim and decide you're letting go, it helps you to move away. Most times when I'm talking with women, the illustration I give is women who go through divorce. And they, it, most times, most times, it is the women who find it def very difficult to let go. So that man is looking good in his business suit and he's moving around with his brand new wife and you're still wearing sweatpants on a summer day with dark glasses and sweater and acting so confused. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> you see him, he probably has come back to you and say, I apologize for what I did to you. I'm giving you half of the property. Never! She was not there when we worked so hard for this. And you become so bitter, you can never smile. Your kids are miserable when they're with you. And when they come from their dad's house and say, Dad is so cool, his wife is so, shut up! <laughs> it's because that man left that chain of anger and bitterness hanging on you. And he has moved on, even though he is the one who offended you. So it's important to let go. I, I, I like to tell the story of Bill Clinton and Mandela. He asked President Mandela, how is it that you came from prison and you never, you, you did not pay back? Or how did you survive? How did you, how, how? He said they took away my freedom for 27 years but I was determined not to allow them to take my mind and my heart. Dr. King also says, never let anyone get to you to the point of hating them. Unforgiveness is toxic. And if you're in this change profession like we are, you can't afford to hold on to anything that's why sometimes when you're sitting and thinking evil as an activist, it finds its way out of your mouth even though you didn't intend for it to jump out. Because there is no space in our world to hold on to anything. And letting go is the most beautiful thing, especially if you have been victimized. And then watch and see how miserable those who offended you become. I have a friend who tells me, Lima, you're so forgiving, it's annoying. <laughs> but there's no other way 
to navigate this world. You can't hold on. Any other question? Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, um, you know, I might just be um, an 18-year-old college freshman, but what do you think is the most effective thing that I can do to help both my local community here and in Nashville, as well as maybe the global community as well? Start local. What are you passionate about? Sit down, think. What am I passionate about? And what is affecting... Okay, so I'm passionate, say for example, about young children having perfect reading skills. Then you want to do your research. How bad is this problem in Nashville? What is being done by different actors in this community to deal with this problem that I'm passionate about or this issue that I'm passionate about? And then you start to work on it. Several years ago, I started volunteering at a hospice in Liberia where people live with AIDS. And by 2003, when we're in the heat of protesting, I stopped and I turned the job over to my mother. Um, after 2007, when I lost my sister in 2006, my mother said death was just too close to home at that place, so she stopped going by 2008 or 9. This January, the Nobel women came to Liberia, and one or two of them had the passion to work with people living with AIDS. That is something that had been talked away somewhere because I've been too busy to look back. And we went to this place. It looked the same. There were 23 women inpatient the day we got there on Monday. Tuesday we went back. I mean, Thursday we went back. There were only 18. The rest had died. The moment we stepped in, one had just died and were trying to get her body to cool off. There were 40 young children living in that space and 19 men. And then we started having a conversation with the sister who runs the place, the missionary of charity, the order of Mother Teresa. And she said, well, we have a lot of helping hands, but what we don't see a lot of are Liberian families coming and giving. <coughs> that moment, my love for that place was reawakened because I realized this is what I like to do. Come sit with these people, help to feed. It gives me a sense of fulfillment. And I've started doing that again whenever I'm back home. What are you passionate about? Start small. Is it women's rights issue? Is there a problem with women's rights in your community? Do you want to even start writing an opinion piece in a local paper? You know, there are so many things that you can do in this world to make a change. And the one thing I want to say to anyone, never ever think that anything that you feel passionate about in your guts is too stupid to explore. Because you know what? The craziest people in the world are the ones that leave legacy. Gandhi was a very educated lawyer, but he wore pants that looked like diapers. <laughs> I meant that in a good way. <laughs> it didn't make sense to anyone, but today, and I'm sure in those years, as he moved from place to place, people would be like, oh my God, this man is ranting again. When we started the protest, one woman said, every time she saw us pass by her house, she said, Lord, Liba and her women have taken their madness pill today. It never makes sense to anyone. But also, if you have a faith in God, just trust him that he's leading you somewhere. Go home, sit down, do a mental check, young woman. And in a few months, you'll be sending emails around. I've got it, and I'm going to go with it. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I was wondering when uh, you put yourself in this environment of violence during your peaceful protesting, how you both managed to protect yourself and your fellow women while voicing your opposition. There was no thought of protecting yourself. 
When the war came, I was 17. When we started protesting, I was 31. I think I've exhausted all of the energy of fear that I had. And it was the same for a lot of the other women. One of the women said the first time the war started, every time a bullet would fire, she would have a loose bow. That's how afraid she was. When we met her in 2003, every time a soldier went into her community and said they were taking this person away, she walked to them and said, not whilst I'm standing here. The way they punish her, they will strip her naked and ask her to bend and pick all of the dirt from the community. And she said, I did that. Was it demeaning? Yes. But I was fulfilled that I was saving people's life. So there was nothing of fear. And you see, I read somewhere that leaders are not fearless, but rather they do not allow their fear to stop them. And those women show immense leadership in those years in Liberia. Because fear stops you from achieving what you're supposed to achieve. And we were also very conscious of the fact that we could die, but the life that we lived then, death was better than that kind of life. So we're prepared to take the risks. The one thing we said to each other was, we do peace advocacy, we die. We sit still, we still die. So let's do something that will make the communities to remember us. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Bowie Lima. Uh, in my lifetime, two Nobel Peace Prize winners come to mind, Martin Luther King from the US and Rigoberto Manchu from Guatemala. Their work, as well as your own, have made history and people worked hard to discredit both of them, especially after they won the Nobel Peace Prize. So my question is, are you experiencing the same thing, people trying to discredit Girl, 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 oh my God. Oh Lord. Naomi, I heard amongst the Nobel laureates they have a name for the prize, which I'm not going to say here, but your dad was the one who invented that name. Because each and every one of us have gone through our own thing. It's not just Rogerberto, it's not just Dr. King. And some days I say to myself, through no fault of your own, you did what you did. Till today, I'm still trying to come to terms with me being a Nobel laureate. I'm 41. My kids, some days they forget. So we get to the airport today, there's a police officer waiting. And he's following us and my daughter whisper, why is he following us? And I say, I bet that we're black people, we think that we're under arrest. I've gotten it from the movement, from outside of the movement. But you know one thing? It takes a lot to break me. I have a calling, and my calling is not in the media's opinion of me. My calling is not in people's opinion of me, and my calling has nothing to do with others who cannot take the success of others. And because I know this is a blessing from God, how do I go back to God or go to men and apologize for God's blessing? What is important in the midst of all of the criticism, continue to do what you know to do. 
Continue to be the voice for the voiceless. Continue to engage with people. Let your work speak for, your, for itself. Don't be self-promoting. Leave all of that to God. It's been hell. And some days I cry. And other days I get happy. But then I rise up after 30 seconds of depression and say there's work to be done. So now I wear it like loose garment. You know, I just float around with it. But also, it guides me so that I don't make the mistakes. I tell people when we won the prize, two people that spoke to me, Jody Williams from the U.S., sent me an email, and then I got on the telephone with Archbishop Tutu. Then we met in Davos. Their words have been with me, even as I walk. So you will always get it. And you know what? If everyone agrees with you, then you have a problem. But if you have more critics, it means you're doing something that people are paying attention to. But I also like the fact that people have gotten critical and they've said things and they've done things. Because now I'm not afraid of criticism anymore. I speak my mind without fear of favor. Yes, sir. Hi, Lema. Hello. Um, welcome to Nashville. My name is Ike. I'm a Fulbright scholar here from Nigeria. Um, when I watched Pray the Devil Back to Hell, I felt a connection with you, and I look forward to your coming, because I think you, you have my kind of spirit, I, I tell my, my colleagues in, in class that I'm going to be the president of Nigeria one day. Amen. And um, what I would like to do is just clean up all the rot in not only Nigeria, but the whole of Africa. Africa has really gone through a lot, um, and it, it grieves my heart to, to look back and see what is happening. After watching your Pray the Devil Back to Hell, I was of the opinion that Africa needs people like you in government so you can just help to sanitize the system. Since Liberia had just come out of um, a rotten situation, I would have wished that you were part of the system because I know that um, Liberia will have made um, much more progress than it is making right now. Now, this is um, a personal opinion. Thank you. Um, I like my day's job. <laughs> I'm definitely going to politics, but a few years from now. Um, we started a foundation a year ago, providing scholarship for girls. I still do the regular advocacy for on women's issues, social justice issue. But when we started providing these scholarships, I realized there's still a lot more that I can do in the field. For example, we put calls out to communities and ask people to recommend students. One of our current scholars is 16, and she's an eighth grader in her entire village, she's the only one who made it to eighth grade without getting pregnant. Another community, we have two scholars from the threshold is fourth grade. And they were the two, this community have no running water, no hand pump, no clinic, no school. So kids have to cross the river to go to school. So by the time the girls reach fourth grade and when it's rainy season, they drop from school. But these two very tiny creatures went through the year and made it. We granted them scholarship. 
We have girls who never imagined that they will go to college because they are the first in their families daring to do so. And when I sit with these young people and see how they get energized, I tell myself, Lema, politics can wait, but these young people cannot. So this is where I find myself today, and I love my job. I love just engaging with them, helping them, talking about crazy things with them. Sometimes they come and ask me, walk into my office, have a seat, and we talk about some of the craziest of things. But one of the things that I've said, even beyond Liberia, is that everywhere I go now as a Nobel laureate, and where time permits, I have to speak at a high school or middle school. Because I think it's important for all of us to use our time, energy, space, and the talents that God has given to us to try to help shape and mold the minds of young people. Has it been all that successful? Yes. Has it been fun? Yes. In some places, I get the craziest of questions. Coming back from New Orleans last year, the kids in the Ninth Ward at one of the charter schools hosted me. And from the beginning of our conversation, Ms. Lima, do your people sleep in trees? <laughs> and I say no. Ms. Lima, do your people ride donkeys? No. So the first group, second group, third group, when the 15 years old came, first girl raised her hand. Ms. Lima, do your people? I said, for the record, I do not sleep in trees. I do not have a lion for pet. I do not drive a donkey to work. And then I turned around and said, look, I do not have a tail. The entire place. Ah! <laughs> but afterwards, everyone wanted to be a Nobel laureate. <laughs> so if I was in politics, I wouldn't be having such fun. But it's great engaging with young people. And this day's job, I'll stick with for a while. When I decide to get into politics, I want my campaign to run itself. Young people who will stand up and say, if she could do it for us without knowing us, we should do it for her. That's where I stand. This is our last question. All right, last question. All right, tonight you've already spoke on a little bit about your motivations and touched a little bit on some of your peace talks, but could you tell us more about your peace talks in Ghana, barricading those and kind of what drove you? Frustration, anger, pain, tired of seeing very hungry people transform into very rich people because they were getting big DSA because that's the way the world works. And it was really, really frustrating. It was draining. And then you, I was at a place where I was questioning the effectiveness of nonviolence. And when you're engaged in a process like that, you do not want to ever get to the place where you start to question your vision. Because once you start to question your vision, it means you're about to lose it totally. So on this faithful day, we had always planned that we would do this. We always planned that we would do the other. We always planned that we would do this. But every time we plan, someone will go and leak the secret. So that day was just me planning. And so when I got to the peace hall, Sugars was sitting there. And then I said to her, Sugars, send for more women. She said, Lima, what's going on? I said, just send for the people already. She said, OK. You know, if you ever had a mentor like at Widow Cooper, you will go places. She never questioned, because she was a troublemaker. So she trusted that I would make trouble. I remember the first time one of the warlords saw the two of us walk together. He walked straight to me and said, Miss Bowie, can I have lunch with you? And I said to him, sir, I don't eat with killers. He said, well, that you're keeping company with Madam Cooper, your future is very bleak. And the two of us proceeded to abuse him well. <laughs> you know, but so when she sent for more women, I sat down and wrote my hostage note, just me. And then I said to the women, just block that area as soon as the delegates go in. So they went in, the women blocked the area. And 
Then I took the hostage note, tapped, the general took it, and over the loudspeaker, they made the announcement, he read the note, people panicked. All powerful gunmen tried to jump out of the windows. But as we were standing there and they came to arrest me, Sugar stood next to me. And when I decided I was going to strip, she was nodding and doing what I was doing. So afterwards, I asked her, what were you doing? She said, we're going to strip. You are going to strip too? She said, yes. We're in this together. But stripping naked or threatening to strip naked at that peace hall was saying to the world, we've endured rape, abuse, we've endured death and destruction. You came and for many years you've taken our dignity or tried to take it. Every time you did something to take away what we hold dearly, we've held back, we fought back, and we've really kind of straightened our spines and refused to crumble. But when I, as an unarmed civilian, stand up to, to challenge what I was taught and has been distorted, to stand up and speak up for women and children who are being battered and abused, to stand up for armless victims, and you arrest me and try to protect them, the world that I knew as a just world just turned upside down. And you know what? I will give you the last shred of my dignity. This is to protest the destruction of the world the way I know it. So it wasn't just an ordinary act. It was an act of giving them everything. Take it. It worked. Two weeks later, we had peace. Today, we're still enjoying a semblance of peace. But today, there's so much that we need to stand up to, stand up for, and speak out against. And sometimes it's a difficult thing to do. But I realize that like many of those who I'm trying to walk in their shoes, our calling as it is, is not an easy one. But you're never, ever alone. So if you, you and you ever decide that I'm going to rock the boat, I'm going to shake the status quo, I'm going to stand up and speak out because my world is being turned upside down. Even if you don't see people around you, go back to the pages of your history book. You're never, ever alone. Thank you.